So I'm so glad to finally meet you in person and to be, I'm so grateful for the work that you guys have done. We actually didn't know you were doing this work before you did it and we were so excited to see it. Um, but I would love to just talk a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are. I know you've been at Franklin for 30 years, which is a crazy amount of time in financial services. It's awesome. No, well, first of all, it's great to be here. And you guys have been amazing partners with us on this journey uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the Benji uh, money market fund. And so uh, we couldn't be, couldn't be happier. Um, but yeah, no, I, uh, you know, I'm third generation at Franklin Templeton. So um, I, you know, am passionate about really thinking about the company in the, the long term. I almost think generationally. And so um, being in this space and, and looking at what blockchain I think is going to do to financial services, you know, I, I feel this drive of we as a firm have to understand it to make sure that we are adopting to the innovations that I think are going to come. What was your first job at Franklin Templeton? Well, do I count my summer job? Yeah, yeah. When I was, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> so I remember I, I had a summer job that I took over for my older sister. And I was like, I think I was stuffing envelopes and doing, we, it was, so we had launched some new fund and yeah. so we was doing something. And my older sister was paid $5 an hour and I was getting, but she was 21 and I was getting paid um, $2 and 50 cents an hour. So I went into my father and I said, I really don't think this is fair. I think I'm a very hardworking employee and I should be paid the same. And he said, well, you can always get a job somewhere else. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is fine. So that, <laughs> that was, was during your lesson. summer? Was that your first summer? Or, I mean, so that was my first summer job there. And then I didn't do many other summer jobs there. And then uh, my first job, uh, I worked for Drexel Burnham right out of college um, in kind of like a trainee program. And then um, I was an executive administrative coordinator. Executive administrative coordinator. That meant... Whatever the COO threw to me, I was supposed to run around and figure out. And then from your from your first job, like you have definitely, like you've been the CEO now for three years. Yes. And you've progressed up the ladder. Is that how you sort of got so there? I, um, so after uh, executive administrative coordinator, <laughs> I uh, moved into, we had a bank at the time. And so I ran a credit card department. And actually it was an amazing experience because at the time, credit card, companies were starting to use data to really predict their clients' behavior. And they were really at the forefront of it. And so I became passionate about how data can truly predict people's behavior. Uh, and um, so I did that for some years. And then uh, we launched an auto lending business and uh, did that for a while. And then this thing called the internet was starting to come along. And uh, we decided that uh, we needed to catch up and build a website and figure out what we were going to do with it. And you remember when the internet first came out, people thought of their website more like a billboard. You know, yeah. it wasn't going to be this communication. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I ran the e-business group and it was always funny because we'd try to get content from the marketing department and, you know, they'd hand you these long brochures because nobody really understood that you needed to, you know, skinny it down for what was going to be on the, on the web. And then at that time, sort of anything to do with the internet was under me. And eventually the internet sort of overtook the technology department. So then I ran all of technology and then ran our operational groups. Um, and then eventually became president and have had, you know, every part of the company under me at some point in time. That's so awesome. I, thinking about the internet, I remember when I first started practicing law. So this was in around 97. We were able to use the internet, but we charged our clients for emails. Wow. Because it was like they were taking the co the photocopy. Oh, and yeah. They were like way. Thinking wow. it like in the Can same way, like doing the email yeah. that way. And there were only a certain number of computers in the office that had access to the emails. Wow. It was just a really different yeah. dynamic. And then I think about today, I mean, most of your business must be just all, well, it's already all been digital for a long time, right. but like online and oh, for sure. that's how your customers sure. engage. And yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, things we were a Microsoft shop. So we use Microsoft Teams. And, you know, we have over 100 offices, 35 countries. The ability to see when somebody's online, you know, like I might need to talk to somebody in India I and I, you know, maybe it's 10 p.m. for me or 10 p.m. for them. And I can say I'm online and I can write a quick chat and say, hey, do you have a minute? It, it's amazing how efficient these tools. Now, the problem is, of course, you can't really turn off either. Never shut down. There's always the challenge. But it brings the world together. I mean, that's the whole intent, right, for the web was like we bring the world together without borders, which is clearly like the same intent that we have 
with blockchain technology is it can create a borderless world, certainly for remittances. But in terms of like the tools that you're building, it doesn't create a borderless world, but it certainly simplifies things. Oh, for sure. And and I actually think um, it's going to drive a lot of cost out of the system, which is good for our clients, for right? Business. You know, if we can deliver higher quality services and do it for less, that's win-win for everybody. And there's no question, you know, I, again, having run the technology and the operations department, I know most big financial services firms probably still have a mainframe, you know, that's in there um, and certainly have enough systems that are doing batch processing at night. I mean, we forget, you know, the New York Stock Exchange had to close in the afternoon so they could settle all the trades. Uh, blockchain, it happens immediately. Real-time settlement. Yeah. It's complicated. And it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's such a great innovation for financial services, and it is complicated to implement in all the different products that you have out there. What was the decision at Franklin Templeton to sort of like jump into this? Because you guys were, I mean, frankly, you're the first one in the money market space. You guys were really early because you started this process in, was it 2020? Oh, I think it was earlier than that. I think it might've been um, 2017 or 18 that we sort of first started talking about it. Um, you know, first of all, we've been in the money market business since the 70s, right? And so, it was recognizing that this was an opportunity to, um, you know, potentially, and I, I don't know that we knew exactly what we were doing as we got into it. Um, I think, you know, again, being in a family business for th three generations, I tend to think like, what if I blow it and miss some great innovation yeah. for the fourth generation? Like, you don't want to be the person who does that. And so we have a lot of things going on. We have an incubator. We, you know, use part of our balance sheet to invest in companies that we can think might be disruptive. And so this was just one of those things that we look at. And I, and I think about today, the two big technologies that I think will be the most disruptive. One is blockchain. The other is AI to traditional, you know, um, financial services. So the only way to do it is to kind of dive in and, and try some things. And so, um, you know, it was under a, a guy by the name of Roger Baston who uh, actually ran our fixed income group. So the so part of the fixed income team. So, you know, they came up. I'm not sure who came up with the idea, but, okay. you know, let's let's try building the uh, shareholder servicing system on the blockchain. And in terms of process for you guys, it wasn't just a, we make the decision and we can now go do it. You have regulatory bodies that you have to work with. Yeah. So no, how was that? I mean, I have to say the SEC was terrific about meeting with us and it was a journey for all of us, you know, trying to understand exactly how to go about this. And, um, you know, it, it, it took a, probably a couple of years, um, but brought them along and, and we became educated in the process and uh, the rest is history. Well, it's so funny because I remember, I think it was in November of 2019, there was a filing that you guys had made that was picked up by, and it was the first mention of the using the Stellar blockchain. And I was like, this is exactly the way that you want open technology to work. You guys looked at this, made your decisions about what you were going to do. No one had to force you. Like no one went out and said, hey, we're going to pay you lots of money to do this. You guys figured it out. We were thrilled to see that because that's exactly what, what we want to see happen all over the world. And what we do see happen, not even like not at this scale necessarily, but small individual developers in other parts of the world can grab the technology and For do sure. it. But once we did, we were like, hey, we should be talking to them. And so we started the conversations and it's just been so nice to watch the journey yeah. and to watch that, you know, you guys like did very methodically approach this. Yeah. And so what's the, what are the benefits that you see for? Well, I mean, of course, you know, at the time we were, uh, you know, trying to figure out which, uh, which platform to use. And, um, you know, I think we ended up with Stellar because of really the capabilities that you guys have that were so important for the regulatory environment, right? I mean, so this this concept of being able to, um, you know, claw back a transaction, right? That that's important. You're, we're required to do that. If there's some something that happens, you got to be able to fix some of those things, um, and you know, have this control environment in which we're responsible for. And uh, you know, the Stellar chain allowed us to do some of those things, and then. Also, you guys just, Stellar's amazing with how cheap your gas fees are. I mean, yeah, there's nobody else that comes near that. And, um, you know, that's important to us and important to our clients. So um, it's really been, a, I think, a terrific journey together. Yeah, the, the idea of the way the network has the consensus mechanism on the network, the way that it operates is to try to maintain those low fees for developers. 
ultimately developers like you are the ones who you you still like have to set it up the processes and certain developers are going to have to charge certain things on for on to layer on for their clients but like that's the notion like technology should be on that side of it it should be on the on the um the, the side to keep things low yeah. so that everything else can grow on top right. of it. So that makes me super happy to hear. It's one of the things we're building other parts of the, the network with the ecosystem, smart contract layers, all those things, and keeping classic stellar, and even on the smart contract layer, really watching and maintaining those fees is a really important part of yeah. what we wanna see. In terms of like what you see next with respect to, whether that be Franklin Templeton or other folks out there that you see like leveraging blockchain, not just stellar, like any, like what do you see happening with this ecosystem? I mean, you've been through, a gamut of financial services. So how do you see this? So I think it's a couple of things. First of all, I do think, you know, so so today we announced adding uh Polygon to the right. uh um you know to the to the Benji ecosystem. And I do think this cross chain or interoperability is gonna be really important. So until that improves, I think that's gonna slow some of the progress, right? And and I describe it a little bit like if you were trying to put together an investment portfolio and you had to choose between the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, you wouldn't be able to pull, pull together a, you know, a full portfolio. So um, I think that's something that's going to hold it back a little bit, um, but it's getting better, right? But I can tell you what we're excited about. One, once we built the system, I mean, we were pretty astonished by how cost effective mm -hmm. it really was. You know, we ran four transfer agency systems that we had ourselves over the years that we had acquired. And so we understood all of the different, that one was on a mainframe and others were on an AS400 and various things, right? To see how efficient the system is once it's built on the chain where you have the permanent record um, got us really excited to say, okay, we can do more. So then we think about, well, what other things can we do? What gets me fired up is not only do I think that it's going to be more efficient, uh, but it's going to open up new types of investment capabilities. And I, I love to use the example of Rihanna's NFT, mm -hmm. um, you know, where uh, she issued 300 of them. I'm sure she was just dabbling in it. Yep. Um, at, you know, $210 each, you get 0.0033% of one of her songs in a royalty. The only way that you could do that is because you have blockchain, which does one, it allows a payment mechanism to a smart contract and three that you can prove you own it with the, with the general ledger. And so, you know, imagine 0 0.0033 is infinitesimal as far as what a payment is. Uh, but you, you know, here somebody can play her song on Spotify, smart contract says, okay, you have the right to this and comes in and, and pays you in your token. That's pretty revolutionary. And so now you think about all the different ways in which you can unlock you know, and making these things investable and accessible to the average person. So you can imagine Rihanna fans are the ones probably buying this initially. Yeah, of course. Um, but imagine if an athlete, you know, he signs a big contract and he wants to sell 10% of, you know, his future earnings. Think of, of the fans that would love to buy into that. And so, you know, there'll be the financial portion of it and then the, what we're, we're calling the kind of the cultural asset portion. So what I get excited about is, Neither of those examples are correlated at all to traditional equity and fixed income. And somebody building an institutional investment portfolio really looks for uncorrelated assets. 2022 was an unusual and difficult year for institutional investors because both the equity market and the fixed income market dropped. That doesn't happen often. Yeah. So you were really, it was a double whammy. So imagine if you had been able to access some of these other types of real assets um, and uh, and and have them be uncorrelated. So that's what gets me really excited. I think we're going to be able to build better, more personalized portfolios for our clients. That's so great. I love that you talked about the interoperability. Cross-chain interoperability to me is the only way that we can actually make sure that we don't end up with the same financial infrastructure we have today, which is antiquated and old. Yeah. So cross-chain piece is so, so important. We focus so much on this notion of figuring out how those bridges can be safe and how you can do yes. right now, the cro the best cross chain, the best way to do interoperability is through a, a centralized entity like yourself mm -hmm. so that you can do that issuance on different yeah. chains. Um, but eventually I think it'll come. Yep. And I think that that actually opens the world up too. And it's more in line with the way that the way that we wanted the internet to be the underlying infrastructure is decentralized and, and open um, and standards based, but everything on top sort of grew very yeah. isolated and yeah. centralized. Um, that's not what we wanted and we don't want that in financial services. So that makes me super happy. And then from the standpoint of um, what the assets, 
like, I feel like that's super limitless. Like the things that can really? like come together and yeah. be pulled. And I think it's like, I am not the creative type. I'm really good at organizing things. I'm really good at putting things together. I'm really good at like managing and, and bringing companies and individuals together. The creative part though, I like, I marvel at that. So when I watch yeah. people come up with these ideas, that oh. is what like drives yeah. it for me. No, and it's, I mean, I've heard of some amazing ones, but I mean, you know, they're, they're, and this is an old one that's been around for a while and kind of poorly executed, but I think it kind of gives you an idea of what's to come. But, you know, there's a St. Regis in Aspen where they've tokenized it. So, you know, in theory, your, your token gets paid just like a dividend on the stock you own part of that right. company. But when you check in, they'll say, oh, you're, you're an owner, you get a room upgrade. So, you can imagine tying those types of things. In the Rihanna case, you know, she could also say, not only am I going to give you the rights to uh, um, to the royalties on the song, but actually I'm going to give you two concerts that you can, in the next five years, that you can get front row seats. And let's say, you know, you use one and then you're no longer a Rihanna, you know, fan, you sell it to me. I will have that right carried in that token. We don't have to go check with any third party. It's yeah. embedded in that smart contract. So, I think we're just at the early stages. I, I always say it's a little bit like when Apple came out with the iPhone and you were like, oh, it's pretty cool. I got, you know, a camera and a, um, you know, and uh, I don't know, uh, music and my phone. And what Apple was doing was unlocking the creativity of people. Yes. And that's where we are, I think, in this ecosystem. I think so, too. And I think that that's the, the best way to think about it. Unlocking the creativity and also allowing it so that one of the things I love about your story about Rihanna and that, and that idea is that it could get to those individuals who wouldn't normally be able to acquire something. Right. Because it could be that even that 0.033% is actually affordable to them. Yes. And so then you're creating that access yeah. that to, that they might have not have had before, yeah. which is what makes me super happy too, and which is the point of the technology is to open open the infrastructure. Well, and I think if that gets younger people saving and investing, oh, that's yeah. a really good thing. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the challenges we have in this country is that people wait too long to start saving for retirement. So if they actually start doing because they love the assets that they're doing, great. So what can we in the blockchain and crypto space learn from someone who has been in this space for, or been in the financial services space for as long as you have uh, that, and we can maybe do a little differently? Look, I, you know, in the end, this will be regulated. Uh, you know, it, it's frustrating. There's not clarity. It's always hard to, you know, if you're, if you're playing a game and you don't know what the rules are, that, that can be difficult. But I think we have to, you know, work constructively with the regulators um, because it's coming, right? Because it's going to be the core to financial services. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is this was, this has been very much a technology driven story and that doesn't always resonate with people. So, you know, one of the things when I go out and try to talk about, it, I, I like to have the examples of a Rihanna because some people they'll go, oh, now I get it, right? Uh, and so I think we have to talk about it in ways in which we are helping people improve their lives, right? What is it that it's going to do for me? The technology is just the tool. Uh, and so I think more of those kind of conversations are important. Yeah, it is the thing that I, I say all the time. And I think if you have to lead with the technology, you've already lost some of the conversation because people want to know how it benefits them. Yeah. Everybody does. Yes. Like that's just the nature of who we are as humans. Totally. We get interested in something yeah. because it'll benefit either us or it'll change the world for someone right. we know. And that's the part that I think that we're just getting to. Dude. Now I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about like the public blockchains and the private blockchains? Mm -hmm. A lot of the traditional financial services institutions are sort of creating private blockchains. How do you see that? Well, I think that the largest competitor to blockchain is obviously databases. So essentially yeah. the private blockchains are just like a glorified database. And that's what, that's what the public blockchains are too, right? We're just a database. That's our big competition. I, from my standpoint, I feel like the minute that you get into the private network and the private blockchains, you're actually eliminating what the blockchain is really good at. Mm. That immutability that nobody else can touch. The fact that when you're on a public network, you know that like, we can't change any of those things that just happened because they happen and they're recorded and they're done. And that's a huge part of it. The notion on a public blockchain that you're having people all over the world who are contributing to the continuity of that blockchain means that 
ideation and creativity is going to continue to build on that blockchain and people will have a voice in what, what the next step is. You don't get that on the private yeah. blockchains. So while I think that there's a place for everything, again, databases are really, really important. Yeah. And some people are much more comfortable with that not being public. I think that for the public piece, what we need to do, and this is what you're going to see over the next five years, I think, is a lot more focus on the privacy angle and making sure that when you do get those, like, let's just say that the Benji, like the, the Benji token you could then use to go buy something at Starbucks, you really want those kinds of transactions so that users can feel that they're not going to be able to be found, found out who each individual right, user right. is. These are things that we as an industry are already working through. Mm. And so I think that you'll see more of that. And then it just becomes less and less problematic. Yeah. Um, it's also a lot cheaper to work on a public blockchain because there's lots of people powering. The yeah. internet is so easy to use because lots of servers are powered. Yeah. yeah. Well, and on that point, I always think the example of the fact that Ethereum went through the merge where they went from proof of work to proof of stake. Yep. Like having run an IT department, just imagine like that weekend, you you know, you were gonna have this massive re-architecture of your all these businesses have been built and you're gonna right underneath them gonna completely change yep. the the platform. And oh, by the way, there's no project manager. There's nobody really in charge. You're counting on this group of people to sort of get it done. And it happens without a hitch. And every business on there benefited from it without paying a dime. So I think that that over time, I yeah. think you were talking about where, you know, people are contributing and you can take those pieces and be able to leverage them again. It's going to be harder, I think, for those private blockchains to keep up with the capabilities. For sure. And the other part about it is part of the value of it is that you actually do have this ability to not have one of the things getting it back to the, the, the web days, like you think Apple and Google, Android and iOS, like everybody needed to learn to build individually for each of yeah, those, yeah. Um, the, the, the different platforms. Ultimately, what you want are standards to be created so that you actually can build for all of the different chains out there and then have them all be interoperable. Yes. When you're in a private chain, that doesn't happen. So you right. need to learn how to work on that chain. So we've actually had a lot of folks, uh, I think I, I can think of at least three different, like that Ukraine did it at one point. And there's other companies that have taken Stellar and created a private instance of it. And they've used it. And Ukraine actually looked at the government there, looked at it at first and they were like, but the value of the blockchain is that it's not that. Like yeah. you can use it for that. Right. So they and then have now gone to the pri to the public network wow. and thought about moving on to the public network for that reason. So I do think that there's just obviously I think that there's value for all of this technology, but I think the public notion of this. And one of the questions I get right from any company that we talk to, they say, well, who's in charge of that? Yeah, exactly. Because that's your instinct, <laughs> yeah. right? When you have, like, especially if you, I ran an IT department too when yeah. I was at Mozilla. And that's the thing. People always want to know, who are we going to go to when exactly. something bad happens? Yeah. Well, the whole idea of this is that you're going to be involved in it. You're going to run your own validators. You're going to be part of it like you guys do yeah. on Stellar, which is amazing. And so you actually have a say. Yeah. And, and actually, I think it, that's one of the things that's not fully appreciated from a regulatory standpoint. So, because if you're a regulator, you're like, well, who's in charge? Like, who am I going to go, you Get know, after, time. right? <laughs> On the other hand, they have more information at their hands. I think they're going to get more comfortable that actually, especially if they leverage AI, they'll actually start to realize they have more transparency into what's going on in the ecosystem to be able to identify bad actors and others uh, on a public chain because the information's there. It is, and that you can never change it. And that's the yes, thing that yeah. I think is the most important about it. It's an immutable public record that can't be changed. And they're already like law enforcement. And when you talk to law enforcement, they're all like, hey, this is great for us. Yeah. Because this is actually, I can follow. Right, I can follow exactly. The, I can follow it on the chain. Um, it's the people who, and I'm not, I'm not being critical when I say this, but the people that don't understand the technology and the benefits of it, that often are the ones who point to the fact to say, oh, it's just being used for bad stuff. Yeah. The truth is, it's way harder to use the blockchain for bad stuff totally. than it is for cash. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> like, we actually know how to follow it. Exactly. Blockchain, so no, I, yes, I couldn't agree with you more it's on that. A, uh, it's, it's fun. So <laughs> thank you so much for all the time um, here today and also just for the work that you're doing. Oh, thank you. It it's was great to really be here. nice to have you. Yeah, thank you.